There is nothing as powerful as the human spirit. Benjamin Disraeli, a former British Prime Minister. If you can change your mind, you can change your life. William James. Progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their mind cannot change anything. George Bernard Shaw. So we all hear this quote from all these brilliant minds. And yet, we read the books, and nothing changes in our mind. So what is the problem? Why? Why do we accumulate all this knowledge, read all this book? And then we we'll put it off or we'll go back to the same thing. And I, I think one of the biggest problems is the people around us, our environment, our drive, our goals. So we, we, we can change where we live, our job, our country, our name even. Our partners, but if we don't change our mind, our mind, the, the only single thing, the, the, the only free will we have, our mind, which is the control of our shape, the commander. And there's this saying from uh, Jim Rohn that you can't change your environment, you can't change the weather. The weather is static well, for, for seasons. You can't change the weather. You can only change yourself. If you change yourself, you change everything around you. If you change yourself, you change your environment. Your environment will remain constant. If you don't change, nothing changes. It's just like blaming everyone around you for where you are. If you don't change, nothing will change around you. You are in control. There's also this sort of saying or the quotes by Jim Rohn. It says, what you become is much more valuable than what you get. That is what you become. What you become attracts. Success attracts success. You could, you could, you could, you, know, you, you could be in the right country, but most of us, like, you know, in Africa, in the wrong country, for that matter, you know, wrong parent, wrong destination, wrong postcode. But if you have the right philosophy about yourself, willing to change, it might not come instantly, but everything will change around you. If you decide to change, I will give you an example. Right when I was growing up, like when I was growing up, like, you know, from a very poor background, and a lot of people around me who grew up like in poverty. And, and some of us decided to uh, go to a tennis club, uh, you know, to uh, become a ball boy like myself, you know, become a ball boy, then progress into becoming a tennis player. For me, that was my apprenticeship. You know, that was my way of trying to become something because I knew when I become something, I would have something to offer. I would have something to bring to the marketplace. But some other people saw this as like, you know, becoming a ball boy was, was, was the low of the lowest. They just wanted what they could get. And some people tried it for a very short period of time, but they weren't getting much. So their sole purpose was about what they could get from instantly, from that minute, from that moment. They, they, they didn't think about what they could become. They on, only saw the short-term goal, what they could get. And since as a bubble, you couldn't get much when you started. So to them, that wasn't beneficial. So they left. 
Well, I, I knew what I could become. So I persisted. I continued. And just long story short, after how many years now, when I go back home, when I go back to this neighborhood, those people who left early because they couldn't see what they could get are still in the same po uh, position. Same position. I mean, probably they, uh, some actually even went to, to university, but most, most time, most, most, most universities teach people how to get a job instead of how to own a business that would provide job. They teach you how to, how to become an employee, how to work for someone. So I go back to my uh, old neighborhood now and I see this guy. Even after uni, they back maybe driving buses, uh, just back in the same place. That's because when we started, they couldn't see and find the future. They only saw what they wanted at that time, what they could get. Just the same thing. You, you can't change your environment. That was our environment. We couldn't change the environment. But I made the decision to change myself. And by changing myself, I added value to myself. So from a ball boy, I knew I could bring value to the market. That is a tennis player. I studied my market. What is needed? What could I provide? What could I offer? What could I offer in the marketplace? And how do I do this? Yeah. How do I bring value to the marketplace? By accum accumulation of knowledge. What is wanted? What, what can I offer? There's, there's, a, there's a tradition in, in Eastern Nigeria where uh, it's an apprenticeship scheme. This is apprenticeship scheme that has been going this apprenticeship apprenticeship scheme has been going on um i think since the since the civil war yeah i think this uh apprenticeship apprenticeship scheme has been going on uh in the igbos community from nigeria i think uh following the emergence from the defeat of the civil war around 1960 uh 1970 yeah 1960 70 you know, and, and the Igbos, uh, Igbos they, they, they lost the civil war. But they managed to recover a significant portion of their pre-war economy status within just two years. Despite the Nigerian government confiscating uh, their bank account belonging to the Igbos, you know, I think giving them just like uh, $20 to start a new life, property seized, even some some of the uh their, their neighbors claiming their land and uh you know seizing their houses most of them started with just twenty dollars and, and from that twenty dollars they've emerged so many millionaires in the Ibu, uh, Ibu community why because of an established apprenticeship scheme that's been running since the 1967. and the thing about this apprenticeship scheme is what the people become what the people become the apprenticeship scheme works in a way where um a, a, mostly a young male goes to serve um like a, a businessman and he goes to serve a business yeah yeah so the apprenticeship runs are in a way where like a boy a young boy mostly from like a, a very poor background uh goes to serve a master the master is like a business owner um it could be any any form of business and mostly these boys would do anything uh including uh washing the the, the master's car doing his domestic errand uh in exchange for this the boys pick up life skills and are taught how to run a business so it's basically like going to business school practical business school they're also given food and where to live uh, and this is done mostly by by, by boys they said they're mostly by boys and uh, because um uh you know most people uh will, will have apprehension about sending uh, their daughters to go live with a man you know and at the end of um, an agreed period uh most bosses not every boss not every the boss as human uh you know you have good and bad not every boss but most of the bosses will set up this young man 
or put capital in order to run their own businesses and and thereby those boys after a few years will become a boss and then will employ another apprentice and and that 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 carries on you know so you grow in a uh, businessman just from one so definitely starting from a 20 dollar business you've grown millionaires you know and and the difference between this is like what the reason why i'm focusing on this apprenticeship scheme which is going on uh most of us know it like when uh when i was growing up my parents said i should go um you know i should go and do this apprenticeship like in the spear part industry like uh why am i playing tennis where's tennis gonna take me you know but i mean they didn't see my dream but being parents they were worried for me they said oh you should go do this apprenticeship and see the son of this the son of course we had a lot of relatives you know being um and the Igbo origin we had a lot of relatives that went into this apprenticeship scheme and came out had a few businesses so they, so they were doing well so my parents was like why don't you go and you know um you know join this apprenticeship scheme you know you know because after school especially when i left school like this tennis where it's going to take you you know so but the the the, the fact and this apprenticeship scheme has has produced a lot of millionaires in nigeria and and all over the place i, I, I think uh the uh, few of the businessmen are, uh, you know, the um, uh, Mr. Ma Maduka, you know, uh, of um, uh, Chugu of Innocence Motors, uh, was Cosmas Maduka Kocharis Co Motors. Those are some of the millionaires and, and countless other millionaires. This, this apprenticeship scheme have, 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 um, have produced, you know, and, and the reason why I'm focusing on this is like, because like, I mean, um, as a kid, I never knew about this, but by reading, but by my current reading, I'm, I'm continuous reading of different uh, great men. Like when I was reading uh, Jim Rohn's book, and well, he was saying, bringing value to the market, what you become. And, and this made sense to me immediately. Like this guy is going to learn about these businesses. They learned how to run businesses. They became businessman, practical. They they understood. They acquired knowledge. Therefore, what they became was more than what they got. And and being human, some of these guys left these businesses, and and the masters never said to them, you know, they accused them of theft and chased them out with nothing. But they were able to stand on their own feet. Why? Because what they have become, they have become knowledge. They have become businessmen themselves without no capital and that's the that's the that's the thing like most people when i speak to them back home uh, the first thing they tell me about is capital uh where's the money i don't have the money i don't have the money but from my understanding what from what i've learned from what napoleon hill says ideas are better than money ideas are more valuable than money because you could give someone who has just won a lottery for it this happens every day when i go to uh, africa this is another thing right now in africa gambling drugs have taken over the youth gambling and drugs taking over the youth and and someone could 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 win a million today and is broke the next day why because the money he has no idea he just came into money and there is countless lottery winners who are now living in abject poverty why because they have no idea money would come and go but idea would take you to the next level idea would take you to the next level so idea is more valuable than money is it jim Rohn or zig ziglar who says better an empty pocket than an empty head ideas will take you ideas will guide you ideas will lead you ideas will make you something and where does all this comes from this comes from the mind if you don't think how can you have an idea if you're not willing to change how can you have an idea i'll give you another example i remember when i was in uh, scotland in my third year, I was basically struggling to, to, to make it into my final year in university. You know, I was struggling with everything. And 
I was struggling with even writing essays. One of my essays I've told you before, um, I, I my first essay was twenty nine percent. The next one was as bad as fifteen percent, over hundred. It was so bad. I was struggling to make it into the final year. This is my third year university. I was struggling really bad. And having just come from Nigeria a few years ago, everything was new to me. So I was really struggling. But then I met this guy, um, a, a young guy, much younger than me. You know, he's always sitting in the front and he's always in the library before and after class. Then I just, I got talking to him and like, what he, uh, what does he do? He doesn't do anything. He's from a wealthy family. He's his dad's uh, in the oil industry in Aberdeen. His mom is in the oil industry in Aberdeen. But he's, he's, he's an English kid. He's, he, he, they moved over from Warwick. So he had a full house rented. So he just bought. But he was in the library two hours before class. He read, he took notes, he went to class. So when he was in, in class, it was when he was in lectures. When other people were, were um, listening to lectures, he was basically correcting his notes because he's already read the handout, made note. He's now listening to the lectures and correcting his notes. So when I sat next to this guy, I was like, man, you know, this guy is doing well. I have to attach myself to this guy. I know I walked, I mean, I walked um, night shift and I went to university during the day. But like somehow I have to find a way to do what this, this guy is doing. So I, I spoke to him. And all he does is that he every after every eight hours in university, he added another four hours to study. And and from my understanding now, I just looking back at that, I now understand why he was a first class student because they said sixteen hours in a day, it's already marked six hours, sorry, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for work. And and most people who work eight hours. Is just to survive. Eight hours work is just to survive. You to to get to the next level, you have to do more than eight hours. And and when when Jim Rohn says work on yourself than on your job, he's he's not talking about the eight hours you give to your employee. He's talking about the eight another the extra the last eight hours because we have three eight hours in a day that makes up twenty four hours. The first eight hours is for is is, is for um sleep. The next one is for work, and there's the last eight hours. What do you do with that eight hours? That eight hours, that's where champions come from. That's where leaders come from. That's where people with innovation come from. That's where people with ideas come from. So he was doing more than, he was, he was given eight hours for class, and he was doing another four hours. Then I realized, I have to do another four hours. I'm like, where is the time going to come? I'm like, well, for now, I do a night shift. So therefore, I could use that hour to study. Yeah, so I have to put in more hours. So instead of sleeping four hours, um, eight hours or night time, I was studying four hours in my night shift. So when I was at work, I studied during the night. And in my final year, this showed because I now knew how to utilize my last eight hours that has just been there. Because I remember then when I went home, what did I do? I watch TV, you know, consume what other people are producing. That's all I did. Watch TV, watch TV. No, but now I was utilizing my last eight hours. And and my, my, my final year result too, because even my lecturers were surprised. Like, what happened, Bishop? What did you do? Because now I now knew how to split my time. My first 16 hours was done. There's nothing I could do about that. But my last eight hours, I knew how to utilize it. I knew how to plan. I knew how to take charge. I knew how to prioritize. And that's what separates the good from the great. How do you manage your eight, last eight hours? The people who spend um, the eight hours a day and that's it, just to survive, are the people who basically go to university just to get a job, work 40 hours, work for 40 years and retire, no more. The graduates. And the people who spend 
the last eight hours working on their craft are those who own the companies where the graduates come to work. Because if you're only doing eight hours a day, you're going to end up becoming an employee. You know, if that's what you want to do in your life, that's fine. You know, but even with becoming an employee, if you want to get to next to, to the next level, you have to take from the last eight hours and do something with it. You can't just go home and watch TV. Your TV is costing you more than, than, than you know, than the price you paid for it. That's where the champions come from. I was listening to Eric Thomas, who was talking about a Corey, uh, that Corey had, uh, I think it was a game, uh, Corey sh shot three points, 21 points in a row, and people were like, wow, that's amazing. That is amazing. But the thing is, you know, were you practice in the dark, that's what people are going to celebrate you in the light. And how do you practice in the dark? You focus on the last eight hours because the first 16 hours is done. You have to dig into the last eight hours. So Corey was digging into the last eight hours. And you know what he said? In practice, Corey was doing 77 shots, 77, 77 points in a row. He was consistently doing 77 points in a row. So therefore, it wasn't difficult for him to come and do 20 point or 21 point, 23 point in a row. Why? Because they're now celebrating his success in the light of what he's been doing in the dark. So if you're not working hard in the dark, no one is going to celebrate you in the light. If you're not utilizing your last eight hours in the dark, you better just remain an employee because there's nothing to celebrate in the, in the light. The light is only reserved for the last eight hours. For those who utilize the last eight hours in the dark, this is just the people who celebrated in the light. Yeah. So better than university degrees, better than where you live, better than what you have right now is your mindset. Is your mindset. Is that mindset of going into something and thinking of what you're going to become rather than what you're going to get. Is that is that mindset of, of people who go into uh, apprenticeship of thinking about what they're going to become rather than what they're going to get. Is that a mindset of this um, of, of 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 the um, uh, of the uh, Nigerian um, apprenticeship Eastern Nigerian apprenticeship scheme that's created so many millionaires because of what they've become rather than what they get instantly. Some of this apprenticeship work for seven years, eight years, and some of them are left with nothing nothing they like they work can you imagine working eight years and seven years for someone to almost 24 hours a day and not earning anything and not earning anything and most time when you're working for these guys you're not treated you're treated almost like a servant something because this is human depending on the boss you get but some of these guys go through this why because they focus on what they are becoming they focus on the end goal they don't focus on what they're going to become. I know a lot of guys, I know a lot of people who have, who have like, if, apart from, this is spread into other parts of uh, Nigeria. Like right now in Lagos, there's so many boys, there's so many young boys who um, came, like if you go to the computer village in Ikeja, there's so many guys who their bosses have set them up after spending. And these guys are as young as like between, uh, 20 to 25 or 28 or 20, they now their own business owners. They own a business of themselves. They are they now their own bosses. And you know what? These guys have spent maybe eight years working for a boss. Maybe they started when they were 19 or so. At the age of 28 or so, they're their own bosses. And you know what? These guys are now employing the graduates most of the graduates are now they are either they are, uh, sales girls or sales boys or something like that so i'm not saying you know education or every university everything is good but especially in nigeria where you never graduate from university for like 10 years for four years course or something like that and why are there someone learning something learning skill and you're coming out, that person is employing you. 
So it's all about what you become. It's all about what you become, what you have to offer to the market. It's not what you get. And and this is this is really this is really messed up a lot of African, a lot of Nigerian in particular. I know I I, I mean I can't speak for every African country, but especially Nigeria, love this is lot has really messed up the youth. Everyone wants to, is just focusing on what they can get, what they can get. I've started a lot of business with young people and all they seem to try to run into the ground. Why? They focus on all they can get. They never see the big picture. They don't want to, they, don't, they just want to become rich the next day. There's no drive, there's no success, there's no planning. And why this goes back to the mind? This goes back to the mind. But the thing is like, you would, you, you will come up, up against obstacles. You come up against problems. You will have fears. You know, that's, that's like the human, that's the human um, nature to, to, to be scared of what we don't know. Instead of trying to understand it, we just run from it. But only the few, only the specials trying to push through this fear. Why? They have courage. They're like, despite the whole thing, I'm going to go through this. They, they develop the, um, the ant philosophy. The ant philosophy, the ants just like constant go, go, go. It's just got, it's got one drive, one drive. It has no option B. It has one drive. The, if, you try, if you're trying to block the ant, it goes around. It. The ant philosophy, they just go for it. They have no other option. Is it that they succeed or they die? Like if, 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 if whatever you're trying to achieve, whatever you're trying to go for, is is so important to you you're so passionate about it like you you're willing to give up your life or that's how you have to 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 think about it i remember this um book i was reading about um there's um was he there's um i think it was socrates like where um an apprenticeship came to socrates and said i wanted knowledge and Socrates says to him, what do you want? He says, knowledge. Then Socrates took him to the uh, river and, um, and dipped him underneath the water uh, for maybe uh, 30 seconds and brought him up and asked him, what do you want? He said, uh, knowledge again. And, and Socrates dipped him maybe for like 30 seconds now and brought him up again. And, and he was like, he was about to, he was, he was out of breath. And Socrates said, what do you want? He says, uh, air. He wanted air. And then Socrates went ahead and said, if you want knowledge as much as you want air you would find it that is the ant philosophy if you want success whatever you are if you have passion if you're passionate about something if you're passionate about something as much as you want air you would get it because why it will keep you awake it will, it will drive you mad you will never be able to sleep whatever you do whatever you think will bring you back to that thing you would have no peace. That would be your number one go-to. You would not be able to function properly except you you accomplish that thing. You have to go for it. You have to develop the ant philosophy. Always in hurry. Always chasing after that. Why? Ant has one goal. They have just one goal, one focus, one purpose. There is build, build, build. Build, build, build. The winter is coming. Build, build, build. Someone's here. Get prepared for winter. We're in the winter. Oh, all right. Okay. Uh, now uh, we just think about summer. So that is the ant philosophy. They think about one thing and just one thing only. They're not distracted. They focus. Mentally focused, physically focused. 100% focused in just one go. Go, go, go. If you have a goal, you have a dream, you have a drive, you have to chase it. Go, go, go every single time that has to be your number one goal the ant philosophy your dream your drive if you have a dream if you have a goal you have to develop the ant philosophy you have to be relentless you have to it has to drive you crazy and you have to welcome that you have to there's no other option if you're not achieving your goal, that's because you, you're you not relentless. You're not relentless. You, you're you not crazy about your goal enough. Your dream is not big enough. It's not keeping you awake. 
That's the only reason you're not chasing your goal. That's the only reason you're listening to naysayers. That's the only reason you're allowing your inner voice to overcome you. That's the only reason. You can say shut up to your inner voice. Why? Because you don't actually believe in your dream. If you believe in your dream, your inner voice will learn to, to listen to you, not the other way around. You would speak and it will listen. It's because in life there's so many obstacles. But, but the obstacles are for those who see them as obstacles. Number one, you have the naysayers around you. You have to deal with those. And then number two, you have the, the, the critic inside you, your inner voice. Others listening to you and say, oh, you shouldn't do that. Oh, you shouldn't do this. Do you think you can do that? You think you can do that? These are the things you have to overcome. If you can overcome the critic inside you, then you can overcome anything. For me, the naysayers has never been a problem. The naysayers has never been a problem. I've been listening to naysayers since I was eight years old. So I've overcome that a long time ago. It just took time for me to overcome my inner critic. That was the main point. When I got up in the morning, I said I wanted to become the best tennis player I was going to be. My problem wasn't the naysayers. My problem wasn't people around me who were giving up. No, my problem was my inner voice saying to me, oh, do you think you should go do um, uh, uh, four hours run? Why don't you just do two hours run? Do you think you should be hitting tennis ball on your own on this wall for, for like an hour while other kids are sitting watching um, tennis on the TV? Uh, do, 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 you, do you think you should be eating healthy while other kids are there eating bread and, and, and beans that's cheaper? That's all has always been my biggest problem. Not the next years. I've learned how to quiet the next years since I was eight. That was not a problem for me. Now for you, that might be a problem. But you have to learn how to overcome that. Why? Because like for me, your destination are different. Where I am today is different from where the next years are today. They still say things about me when I come to uh, my neighborhood. Oh, now nah, it's now this, it's now that, it doesn't do this. Regardless of whatever you do, it's never going to be enough for the next years. And as soon as you stop listening to them, as soon as you stop taking approval for them, the better for you. But that has, I've quieted the next years since I was eight years old. So for me, my biggest critic, my biggest challenge was my inner critic, my inner voice. Willing to listen to it sometimes. But, but, but thank God I had drive, I had go. So when it says, yeah, when my inner voice says, Do you, is, is two hours run not too much? I was like, come on, man. I'm not even number five in the, in, in the country. What are you talking about? Num, 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 number one is, is doing four hours run and, and you're saying I should do, come on, come on, man. I talk, I talk here, and then, then it's like, okay, I, I, I see your point. My, my, my inner critics is now like my, 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 my defender. It's like, yes, I see your point. I see why you have to do four hours. Don't you think you should do five hours? I'm like, yeah, I think I might do five hours now because if, if number one is doing four hours to catch up, I've got to do more. So you have to overcome your inner critic. That is the number one thing. You have to overcome your inner critic. This says, um, first you build a habit, and then the habit makes you. Once you build a habit, you become your habit. But first, you have to create that environment. You have to create that habit. You have to create that space to exist. And then it becomes you. Once I've, I've broken that inner critic, every time I got up to run, now I'm thinking about, should I do four or five hours? Should I run for four or five hours? That became my attitude. That became my habit. It was, there was no question about it. Why? Because I overcame it. You have to learn how to overcome your inner critic. You have to learn how to overcome your obstacles. Now, don't let anyone stop you. Don't let anything stop you. This is your playground. This is your glory. You deserve this. You've been working out so long. You've been praying and fasting and casting and doing all that. But have you trying to put in practice, work towards all this? Have you, have, have you walked and prayed like it says in the Bible? 
Have you looked at your skill? Have you looked at yourself? Whoever you, you're falling short and trying to improve on that. There's a lot of things in life that you have to do. There's so many things you have to do for yourself. But the change comes back to you. Just you. You have to make it happen. Nothing. Your environment will not change if you don't change. The season would be the same. It's always been the same. The season will continue to be the same. But you have to change. You have to change. And most time it's raining like uh, thunderstorms. But you still go out. Why? Because you get an umbrella and you just walk out. If you wait for the rain to stop, you might miss your appointment. But sometimes you just get an umbrella and you go. Why? Because you made the decision you have to go regardless. Well, if you decide to wait for the rain, you might miss your opportunity. That's what life is. You decide to do regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the situation, regardless of the time, the period. You do. That's all you do. You do. Like the, the, only, the only person you have to convince is yourself. That is the only person you have to convince to make things happen in your life. There's no other person. God has given us just one mind, one heart, one soul, one life. The only person you have to convince is yourself. As if Fred Allen that says, you only live once. But if, if, if you live it um, right, you rock your well. Do you only have yourself to convince just one life? How do you live this life well? Now, you don't ask yourself when you're hungry, why? Why, why am I hungry? Why do I need to eat? Why am I hungry? Why, why am I thirsty? Why do I need to drink? When you feel like sleeping, you don't ask yourself, why am I feeling sleepy? Why do I need to sleep? But then you ask yourself, why are you in this situation and nothing is changing? Why do you need to be more than, than you are today? Why did you not give in more today than, than, than yesterday? Why are you allowing another person to outwork you? Why are you drawing so much on, on your... On, 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 on your talent and you're never replenishing it. There's, there's this Australian uh, tennis player, which uh, I, I know, a very young guy. And everyone knows him like um, as a very talented person. But he hasn't won anything of significance. Why? Because he relies on his talent alone. He relies on his talent alone. I mean, now your talent is not like a savings whereby if you have a savings, you don't have to touch it. It will just grow, you know, with time. You, you have to continuously refresh your talent, continuously brush your talent, work on it, refine it. Your talent is not limitless. You're not God. You can't keep drawing your talent and drawing your talent and, and, and um, imagining why it's never improving. No. You would run out of faith. That's why this guy is so talented. But he's never he's beating all the top players in the world. Everyone. But why? He's never achieved anything of great. He's never won any of the biggest.